Good evening, I'm Andrew Cheng. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, more COVID cases linked to a Quebec City bar's karaoke night. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. How singing became super spreading. Its safety profile is well established, and it's inexpensive and quite broadly available. Encouraging treatment news for people who get really sick from COVID-19. Did you see because it's a black person? What Ottawa's chief of police said when we asked him. And as Canada schools reopen, our doctors answer your questions. Whether you're a teacher, a parent, or a student, we've got you covered. This is The National. Well, as we brace for the fall and the uncertainty of a new season, there are late summer signs that some are letting down their guard when it comes to COVID-19. So call it COVID fatigue if you want, but with the new school year here, it is no time to relax. In fact, Canadians are about to face their biggest test yet. Quebec City is experiencing this firsthand after an outbreak at a local bar spread to dozens of people. Today, health officials confirmed it has also reached schools, all because a few customers chose not to follow the rules. Alison Northcott explains. A night of karaoke at this bar is having a ripple effect in this Quebec City neighborhood. There was uh, this huge uh, amount of people who have been infected. Of course, it's very, very troublesome. At least 40 cases are directly linked to Bar Le Kirouac, but there are secondary cases too, including among children in schools. Three positive cases, namely children, get the virus from somebody who was celebrating something in this bar. The bar is temporarily closed. We took it up last minute. Its owner, Lucien Simard, now in isolation, told Radio Canada earlier this week that he followed public health measures. But health officials say some infected customers may have visited other bars in the area too. When the owners of this bar heard about cases at Le Kirouac, they put up a sign asking that bar's customers to stay away, but say not everyone did. Je trouve ça un peu mal I find that dishonest, says co-owner Geneviève Tremblay. Now her bar is also closed as a precaution. I think a lot of people have forgotten that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. He says an indoor karaoke night can be a good way to spread the virus. Any situation where you have a group of people together and where they're singing or yelling or talking loudly, you can infect more people. And so those become what are sometimes referred to as super spreader events. Quebec bars are only allowed to operate at half capacity. And while dancing is forbidden, singing is not. But it's not recommended either. If we do repeat this kind of uh, karaoke situation, it's going to be uh, not good for uh, the control of the transmission in the community. Quebec City Police say they've launched an investigation along with public health involving some of the customers who visited the bar that night. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Now, an outbreak like that one in Quebec City is something that all provinces are watching for, especially as some continue to see their numbers head in the wrong direction. Today, four provinces accounted for almost all of the 499 new cases of COVID-19. Quebec, Ontario, Alberta and B.C. each reported more than 100 infections, while the number of active cases in B.C. reached yet another record high. Now, as we've seen over the past few months, reopening businesses comes with risk. And as recent cases of COVID-19 have shown, malls and retail giants are not immune. Cameron McIntosh takes a look. Final days of back-to-school shopping in Winnipeg's Polo Park Mall. Crowds trickle by, socially distanced, mostly masked. There are even some temperature checks. Not exactly comfortable, but for Kaylin Lazaro and Marilyn Tark, tolerable. I feel pretty safe. I'm not wearing mine right now, but I normally do wear a mask, and I also do try and social distance from others. All along, there were predictions reopening retail would bring positive tests and temporary closures. Last week, Winnipeg's IKEA shut for a day after an employee tested positive. A dozen employees have also tested positive at this Edmonton Walmart, which is closed for cleaning. In both cases, it's unclear where the infections occurred. And in the GTA, three restaurants and one store in two separate malls have just reopened after being linked to positive tests. Still enough to convince some to stay away. Do you want to go? Do I want to go? If you don't want to go, we don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks for letting us know. 
So what are the actual risks of infection in a mall or a big box setting? Experts say there's lots of variables. So the risk really depends on who you're with, were they wearing a mask, where, how close were they, is it in a closed space? Malls and box stores have lots of open space, but risks rise when people pack themselves into smaller spaces like individual stores. I wouldn't say that at the present time we can ever eliminate that risk. So really it's kind of a balancing of risks and benefits. In those Toronto cases, there are similarities. Some of the cases that we know of um, that have occurred in the last few weeks and in the last few days in particular have been associated with some degree of socializing uh, in closed spaces, in indoor spaces, and with close contact without masks. Practice the, the golden rules, you know, wear a face mask, wash your hands and social distance. And, and that's, that's what we have to do. Tark and Lazaro don't see it ending. It's kind of what we're going to have to get used to. Finding that balance between staying open and staying safe. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Among the sickest COVID patients, inexpensive, widely available steroid treatments may end up saving lives. That is the finding of a newly published clinical trial, a finding now endorsed by the World Health Organization. Ficodopia takes a look at the implications. For COVID-19 patients in intensive care, as many as 40% won't survive. But treatment with corticosteroids could change those odds, according to new research. This is far and away the largest effect that we've ever seen in a population of sick patients. Marshall's team reviewed seven new major clinical trials involving different intravenous corticosteroids. The results for every 25 patients in the ICU treated with either dexamethasone or hydrocortisone, deaths fell from 10 to 8. In theory of the nearly 860,000 COVID deaths worldwide, more than 170,000 people may have been saved with corticosteroids. So it's a robust kind of effect. It's a drug that we know very well and its safety profile is well established and it's inexpensive and quite broadly available. Excitement about the possibilities of corticosteroids began in June when an Oxford study published promising results for critically ill patients. Then some hospitals began using corticosteroids right away before this latest research was even published. I think that this data um, cements that decision and um, my, my expectation is that it's essentially the standard of care in Canada. The WHO initially warned against using corticosteroids because they were ineffective for SARS and potentially harmful. This latest research still doesn't explain how the steroids help patients with COVID-19 recover, though there are theories. The later phase of this disease is dominated by an inflammatory component and hyperinflammation. And I think steroids uh, are very good at decreasing that inflammatory component. The WHO warns taking corticosteroids won't protect people from getting COVID-19. Still, they're invaluable as hospitals prepare for the second wave of the pandemic. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. France is struggling to keep the virus under control and is now nearing its all-time high for daily new COVID-19 cases. Well, today it recorded over 7,000 new infections, just below its peak back in March of about 7,500. The number of people being hospitalized, including in the ICU, is also climbing, but the system isn't under strain because it is mostly younger people getting sick. Still, the surge in cases is worrying Canadian tennis star Milos Raonic, who in a month will be competing at the French Open with perhaps thousands of fans in attendance. Hard to get to your practices, get to your matches without crossing uh, tens, if not hundreds of people um, on the ground. So that, that to me is the biggest concern. Organizers said in July they were planning to have up to 60% of the usual number of fans. Toronto Raptors president Masai Ujiri is being accused of exploiting racial tensions by the California sheriff's deputy who is suing him. It's all about their courtside altercation last year at the NBA final. The officer is suing for alleged injuries and lost wages. Ujiri's countersuit raised his race as a factor. Now the officer's legal team says it believes Ujiri is taking advantage of changing opinions on law enforcement while falsely alleging racial prejudice. I think the video we've all seen speaks for itself, and I would say, as Torontonians know well, the character of Masai Ujiri speaks for itself as well. 
Today, the Raptors declined to make any comment. Well, an Ottawa man who is black says he was racially profiled by a white police officer during a recent traffic stop. He recorded the encounter and has now shared the video online. Hillary Johnstone shows us that recording and how it's being interpreted. How long has it been rented again? Jean-Claude Fenelon recorded this video in July of an Ottawa police officer pulling him over and wrongly accusing him of having expired license plate stickers. The validation tag expired in December. Well, you call Enterprise. That's not my car. The officer eventually realizes the stickers are in fact valid and admits his error. Oh, that's my mistake. Well, that's your mistake. That is my mistake. Did you see because it's a black person? The officer denies race had anything to do with the encounter, but Fenelon says he doesn't buy that. He says he's been pulled over before and complaints to Ottawa police went unanswered. When I pass close to him, you know, I see look at his, he look at my, me at the window, you know, and it was like two, two, two three minutes, uh, I mean, 10 seconds after, you know, I see he pulled me over. Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly has said publicly he will tackle racial discrimination within the ranks. He's also trying to mend relationships with Ottawa's black community over the death of Abdurrahman Abdi, a mentally ill black man who died following a violent altercation with Ottawa police in 2016. But today, when asked, he wouldn't comment. If you'll contact our corporate communications folks, be happy to set up a different media interview for that topic. Ottawa police declined multiple CBC requests for an interview. In a statement, they said, during the interaction, the officer realized he made a mistake. He owned it and fully apologized for it. The Ottawa police is very aware of the legitimate concerns raised by community members about racial profiling. My son was pulled over while I was on a, a Zoom call talking to city officials about uh, anti-black racism. This community activist says he supports the work the police chief is doing, but the task ahead isn't easy. I think it's hard for uh, folks to uh, recognize that change uh, is, is cultural, that it requires um, a different mode of thinking. At least one Ottawa Human Rights Coalition is now calling for the Ontario Human Rights Commission to conduct a broad public interest inquiry. Hillary Johnstone, CBC News, Ottawa. To the U.S. now, and yet another story of a fatal confrontation between police and a black man, this time in Rochester, New York. That was the site of protests in support of the family today. I placed a phone call for my brother to get help, not for my brother to get lynched. How many more brothers got to die for society to understand that this needs to stop? And I can't even share with y'all the pain that I'm feeling and my family is going through as well. Now, Daniel Prude died in March, but evidence of what happened, obtained by the family's lawyers, was just made public today. Prude was in his underwear when confronted by police in the middle of the night. The video shows them putting what's known as a spit hood on his head. This was the early days of COVID. When he struggles, his head is driven into the pavement and held there for two minutes, then he stops moving. He was taken to hospital, but taken off life support seven days later. Now, of course, the U.S. has seen months of protests over police brutality and racial injustice. And today, a response from Donald Trump's top law enforcement official. In an unusual interview, Attorney General William Barr defended police actions and seemed to downplay concerns of black Americans. Paul Hunter has the details. What do we want? What do we want? As Americans grapple over the issue of racial injustice and the deaths of black Americans at the hands of police, today, a remarkable interview by the Attorney General of the United States, Bill Barr, pressed on the suggestion many believe there to be, in a sense, two justice systems in America, one for whites, another for non-whites, said Barr today. No, I don't think there are two justice systems. Let's, you know, I, I think the narrative that uh, there's a, that the police are on some, uh, you know, epidemic of shooting unarmed black men is simply a false narrative, uh, and also the narrative that that's based on race. Worth that noting that Barr said unarmed black people. More generally, black Americans are shot and killed by police in this country at twice the rate of white Americans. On the treatment broadly of blacks by police, said Barr. I do think that there appears to be a phenomenon in the country where African Americans feel that they're treated when they're stopped by police frequently uh, as suspects before they're treated as citizens. Uh, I don't think that that necessarily reflects some 
uh, deep-seated uh, uh, racism in, in police departments or in most police officers. I think uh, the same kind of behavior uh, is uh, done by African-American police officers. That Barr would weigh in on such stuff is noteworthy unto itself, with Trump effectively now campaigning on the issue. Yesterday, both were in Kenosha, Wisconsin, home of the latest high-profile police shooting of a black man. Barr is a Trump appointee, and attorneys general historically steer well clear of politics. Barr today agreed to be interviewed at length. Do you think black people are treated differently by law enforcement than white people? I think there are some situations where statistics would su suggest that they, they are treated differently, but I don't think that that's necessarily racism. Meanwhile, Donald Trump tonight targeted some of the cities that have seen some of the largest protests against racial injustice, ordering a review of federal funding for cities, as he puts it, that allow anarchy, violence and destruction and deteriorate into lawless zones, citing Seattle, Portland, New York and the U.S. Capitol. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. To Paris now, where 14 people went on trial today, accused of helping three gunmen carry out horrific attacks on the Charlie Hebdo magazine office and a kosher grocery store back in 2015. Renee Filipponi shows us why the trial should serve as a warning to others. It was an attack that evoked global outrage when two men stormed the office of satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo and started shooting. 11 staff and a security guard were killed. De guerre, hein? This former terrorism prosecutor, one of the first on the scene, described it as a war zone with bodies piled up. The terror continued for the next two days with an accomplice who killed a police officer and opened fire at a Jewish supermarket, killing four people. All three attackers were killed by police. Security was high at the courthouse today, where 14 defendants are facing an array of charges related to supplying weapons and providing support to the jihadists. You can feel the tension, says the wife of one of the Charlie Hebdo journalists killed. She is looking for answers about why this happened. This former French intelligence agent hopes the trial will not only give insight into terror networks, but send a strong message. Where is the difference between be just the friend of someone who acts badly and be an associate? I hope this will be a lesson for other people who could be involved in this kind of, uh, of reflection and of actions in, in the future. The attack set off the movement Je suis Charlie, advocating for freedom of the press. Over the years, Charlie Hebdo had published controversial cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. The magazine chose to publish them again this week. Cette liberté d'expression. Francois Hollande, who was president at the time of the attacks, is backing that move and defending the right to blasphemy. But Zineb al razoui who worked for the paper, says freedom of expression in France has been lost. It still exists on paper, she says, but do it at your own risk if you draw the profit. In a trial that's set to last 49 days, there are hopes the three shooters' connections in France and abroad will become clear. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. In Belarus today, anti-government protesters got creative. <laughs> so they called this a cat flash mob. Women formed a human chain and meowed to demand free speech. All this as the Belarus foreign minister visited Russia, a key ally against critics who say the recent Belarus election was rigged. Russia's relations with the West are set to go from bad to much worse after a damning accusation from Germany today. Doctors there say they would they have solid proof Russia's opposition leader was poisoned last month with a Soviet-era nerve agent they say implicates Vladimir Putin's government. Chris Brown looks at the fallout. <laughs> The poison that left Alexei Navalny screaming in agony on that flight over Siberia was assuredly a nerve agent, said the German doctors treating him, but only today did they confirm it was Novichok. He was supposed to be silenced, said Germany's Angela Merkel, and I, together with the entire German government, condemn this. Infamously, Novichok was a Soviet-era nerve agent 
used to attack Sergei and Yulia Skripal in England in 2018. The prime suspects were Russian security agents who concocted a bogus story that they were just there to see the city's cathedral. And tonight on Russian state TV, there were more predictable denials that Russia's government tried to kill Navalny. There are no facts, just another announcement, said Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zaharova. Vladimir Putin bears direct political responsibility for what happened. Activist Vladimir Karamurza has survived being poisoned twice. There should now be no more talk of any kind of resets or overtures or, or any kind of attempts at business as usual with a regime that speaks to its political opponents in the language of poisons and bullets. Even as he lay in a coma, Navalny's team kept up their hounding of Vladimir Putin and his regime. They released their latest video investigation, what he was shooting when he was poisoned. It suggests Kremlin-friendly candidates in the city of Novosibirsk have been getting enormous kickbacks for years. The Berlin hospital that's treating Navalny has released a statement saying that while his condition is improving, his friends and family won't know if there's been long-term damage for a while. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. A viral video from British Columbia has sparked a debate about keeping people and bears safe. I was panicking in my head. I thought about running away. Up next, what's happened since this wild video was posted? Plus, we dive into the details of back to school. I was wondering if I could share my school supplies when we go back to school. Your questions answered. And Harry and Meghan's big deal. What they're planning on producing for Netflix. This could never have happened in the UK. It's got people talking on both sides of the Atlantic. We're back in two. A new wildlife report says Canada isn't doing enough to protect its endangered species, declaring since 1970, populations at risk have plunged by an average of 59%. The study says animals face several threats, including from climate change. It calls on the government to create protected areas and focus on conservation efforts led by Indigenous peoples. A well, stunning video out of B.C. of a bear reaching out to touch a jogger has ignited a debate over what to do when bears get too close to humans. Susanna De Silva spoke to the woman at the center of it all. I was panicking in my head. Uh, I didn't know what to do, where to go. What to do about a black bear creeping towards her, then reaching out. I thought about running away, um, but... I thought maybe the bear was going to chase me, so I just stopped. I was like, is it going to come at me even more? But it didn't, and she ran away only to watch the encounter online, filmed and posted by a passerby. Some accused her of trying for a selfie. I definitely wouldn't risk my life for a selfie, um, so that wasn't the motive there. That section of the popular trail has been closed and a trap set to catch the bear. It's not normal behavior for a bear to approach someone in that way. Um, it had me wondering what led up to that situation where the bear was approaching someone. And I had to wonder, had the bear been fed before by someone? Conservation officers say it could be euthanized if they believe it is too used to humans, but over 16,000 people have signed a petition to save it, with some saying they won't even report sightings, fearful bears will be killed. I don't think that's a good decision, but I think they should be moved, if anything, but we're encroaching on their land, so... I feel like we have to do everything we can to not bother them or get them acclimatized to us. Earlier this week, a bear made a stop at a Revelstoke liquor store, and in July, one checked out a Whistler resort. Some experts say bears are naturally curious and need to learn to stay away from people, and people need to learn how to deal with them. We're overreacting to what actually happened. Recognize that you are going into a place that bears live. Bring your bear spray, use your voice, but the human voice means something to these animals, and they will listen to it. Some saying people aren't getting that message fast enough, costing bears their lives. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, when we come back, we asked for your questions, and our inbox was snowed under. Yeah, so right after this, special coverage of your back-to-school issues. If a kid in school is sick and our kid was in contact, does only our child have to isolate? 
parents, teachers, and students sound off. Our classrooms have pretty poor ventilation and some pretty small windows. I was wondering if I could share my school supplies when we go back to school. How are we going to eat with our masks on? Getting back to class while keeping you, your family, and your community safe. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of a school year like no other. We're back in a moment. <laughs> that September sound, back to school, is underway. I am very excited <laughs> to see all my friends. I'm just excited to go. But this year, that familiar routine looks quite a bit different. Well, it's kind of weird, actually. My favorite mask. From masks to distanced desks and staggered starts, the rules may vary from province to province, but the common feeling, anxiety. None of us feel safe about going back to school. Not one person that I've talked to feels safe. We're a bit nervous and not sure how everything will go. Parents, students, and teachers have questions about safety in school and how COVID is changing the classroom. So tonight, we are putting some of those questions to two experts. Dr. Susie Hoda is an infectious diseases specialist with Toronto's University Health Network. And Dr. Danielle Martin is a family doctor and chief medical executive at Women's College Hospital. Uh, thank you to the two of you for joining us. Dr. Hoda, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, this is a question coming from Grace, who is a grade 10 student. Are children and teens less likely to have experiences or symptoms with COVID-19 that would categorize them as long haulers? Okay, so Dr. Hoda, maybe first you could explain what a long hauler is and then, then you can go for the question. Right, so I think we've all heard stories about these long haulers and they typically are um, young or middle-aged adults who were previously healthy, but after recovering from COVID-19 infection, they tend to have lingering symptoms and it can be a variety of symptoms that, that people experience from fatigue and headache that go on for months to um, even serious things like heart palpitations and what people have called brain fog. So difficulties really kind of sorting through things and memory problems. And we really don't know what causes those symptoms. Um, and ultimately we need to get a lot more research into it to understand it. When it comes to children, uh, we don't really have a good sense of what the long-term consequences of infection are. There's a lot of discussion about how kids tend to have milder infections when they get COVID-19 or, you know, even have no symptoms at all. But, you know, what those lingering effects could be or what might happen down the line is really unclear at this point in time. So, so I think we have a need for, for more research into this area to understand those impacts. Yeah, tough question to answer. And so I, I suppose caution is, is the order of the day all the same. Um, Dr. Martin, so here's a question that came in via email. This is from Sandra, and I'll read it for you. Shouldn't school-based staff, bus drivers, and students get tested prior to the first day of school? And, and Dr. Martin, I mean, worth mentioning here, we, we put this question to a few of the biggest school boards across the country, so Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and not one said that it would be requiring staff to be tested before coming back. So, so tell me, is that a good idea? Sure. I mean, first of all, it's not wrong to get tested, but uh, the reality is that even in healthcare, where we're, uh, we have much higher risk of exposure to the virus, hospitals and other organizations are not requiring that all staff get tested. Remember that if you get tested before the first day of school, all that really tells you is that you don't have a positive test on the first day of school. And we know that for when you're testing large numbers of people who don't have symptoms, those tests are not always totally reliable at the population level. So the most important thing, I mean, if we were going to do that, we would be having to test everybody all the time at a very high frequency in order to give us useful information. Otherwise, it's just a, a single data point at one moment in time. The best thing that we should be doing, the most important thing that we should be doing is if you have any symptoms at all, you shouldn't go to school and you should be tested. And that applies to, to you if you work in a school or if you're a student at a school. Those are the people we need to really focus on testing. Right, and I know a lot of people, they might be surprised to hear what you just said, that, that even in a hospital setting, it's certainly not the norm that every, every nurse, every doctor, every staff member gets tested uh, every day, you know, for example, when they come in. Dr. Hoda, that's, that's your experience as well. 
Absolutely, and I agree with everything that Dr. Martin's mentioned. Um, testing, you know, the, the other downside to it is if you test people and they come up negative, I think, you know, sometimes it gets, they get a sense of security from that that can be false and misleading. And they can change behaviors in terms of what they need to do to prevent infection transmission. Um, and so that's one of the downsides, too, that I caution people to. Okay, uh, Dr. Hoda, we'll have you take this next question. This is from a teacher in Toronto. Uh, our classrooms have pretty poor ventilation and some pretty small windows. So I was wondering if it would be worth it to get a couple of those window fans to draw some of the air in and out, uh, if that will help mitigate the contraction of uh, COVID-19, or would that make things even worse? Hmm. What do you think? Yes. A great question. I mean, we know that ventilation is really important for infection prevention with COVID-19. And fans seem like a good solution when you're not really sure about the ventilation in your school. And, you know, many schools were built quite a long time ago, maybe not to the kind of standard that we would accept today. Um, so it is an issue. The problem with fans is that they tend to disperse um, particles and that could include virus that might be in the environment in pretty erratic and unpredictable ways. And so they can actually paradoxically increase your risk of getting exposed to the virus if it happens to be floating around in the environment. So I wouldn't really think that's a good solution to the problem. I think what's more important is for schools to be looking at their ventilation systems and trying to uh, make sure that they're well maintained and, and working as best as possible. And, and looking towards the other prevention measures that we have in place, like right. physically distancing people and masking, um, to complement that and, and make it as safe as possible in right. environment. Now, now, speaking of masks, uh, no surprise we're getting lots of questions about those, especially since a lot of kids will have to be wearing one uh, on the school premises. So here's a question from these uh, two grade two students. Do we need to wear masks during school? And if we need masks, do we need to switch it a few times during school? And when we're eating, how are we going to eat with our masks on? All very good questions, Dr. Martin. Why don't you take them off? Sure. I mean, the first answer is yes, it is a very good idea to wear a mask when you're in school. And if you're going to be playing close to friends in the schoolyard, you should also be wearing a mask even in the schoolyard. Uh, but certainly in the classroom and in the hallway, you should wear a mask all the time. And you can practice wearing a mask at home. This is one of the ways that parents can help their kids to prepare for back to school is practice how to wash your hands, how to put the mask on by, touch, by touching the elastics, how to wear it so that it fully covers your nose and your mouth and your chin, and then how to take it off when it's time to eat. Don't try eating with the mask on because that won't work. And the most important thing when taking off a mask to eat is uh, to find a clean place to put it down. And when you put it down or when you put your mask back on, not to touch the outside of the mask because that's the part that is um, exposed to the outside environment. And so parents can really work with kids to help them to practice and teach those skills. You wash your hands before you put it on. You wash your hands after you take it off. And you can wear the same mask all day long, as long as it's not dirty or wet. Um, but it's also a good idea to have an extra mask in your backpack all the time, just in case you lose or break your mask or it gets wet or dirty in some way. Okay, uh, excellent answers. Uh, don't go anywhere. We're just going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we are going to ask more questions, including this one. I was wondering if I could share my school supplies when we go back to school. Such a good question. Uh, that's Theo, by the way, and we'll answer it in just a moment. Okay, welcome back. Dr. Susie Hoda and Dr. Danielle Martin are answering some of your back-to-school questions. So uh, let's start with that question that we played for you just before the break from 8-year-old Theo. This year I'm going to grade three. I was wondering if I could share my school supplies when we go back to school. Uh, contaminated pencils, erasers. Uh, Dr. Hoda, what do you think? Yeah, so I think we've learned over time that surface-based transmission for COVID-19 seems to be less of a factor, and really it's the respiratory route of transmission that's most important. The virus doesn't tend to last on most materials or surfaces for longer than hours uh, or days. But that said, if you've got items that are, you know, really frequently handled by lots of different people, it could pose a risk. 
And so, first of all, it's really important to reiterate hand hygiene and cleaning hands um, very frequently in schools, but it's also why we not recommend that kids actually share their school supplies. Uh, if right. they have to share something, then disinfecting them between uses is important. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Dr. Martin, so with, you know, cold and flu season around the corner, we've been getting lots of questions like this one. Take a listen. If a kid in school is sick and our kid was in contact, does only our child have to isolate or does our entire household have to? Ah, that's a toughie. Well, it's confusing, right? And then, so as a general rule, when it comes to infectious disease and public health, we worry a lot about direct contacts. We worry a lot less about contacts of contacts. So in this case, if my kid goes to school and then comes home and has a fever or a cough and tests positive for COVID, then she would have to self-isolate and so would everyone in our household. But if she comes home from school and someone else in the school has tested positive and she feels well, she may be asked not to come back to school for 14 days, but in all likelihood, I will be fine to continue to come to work. The and bottom line is that every situation is going to be different. And so you're going to get clear advice from public health and from your school if that situation arises. But as a general rule of thumb, think about direct contacts and uh, worry less about contacts of should those contacts of contacts get tested themselves or is even that not really necessary? You know, I think that's going to be a case by case decision is the short answer. Right. Um, right. But in most parts of the country, I think tests are widely available enough that if people are significantly worried or there's, you know, elderly grandparents in the picture or depending where you work or that sort of thing, uh, sometimes getting a test would be a good idea in that circumstance. Okay. Uh, sure. These were really, really good questions uh, from our viewers and really smart answers. So Dr. Hoda, Dr. Martin, thank you so much for your time. It was really good to talk to you. Thanks, Andrew. And hey, we'll be asking your questions about COVID-19 on a regular basis. So I know you've got more questions. Send them in. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Now, for those kids who haven't gone back to school yet, parents may be looking for a way to keep busy in these last few days of summer, maybe head to a museum. But like everywhere, the pandemic has changed that experience. Here's a quick look. Intimidating, isn't it? Like a lot of things, I suppose, these days. But museums are saying we are ready to welcome you back. So here's what you should expect, starting with this. Increasingly in Canada, Heading indoors into a public space means that you must wear a mask. But also, and maybe particularly for museums, art galleries and the like, pay attention to the time. The hours of operation may have dramatically changed. Plus, we are inviting people to get time tickets in advance, buy a ticket for whatever time of day that you want. And that way we can make sure that we have the right level of capacity. Besides that, the biggest change revolves around physical distancing from other people, but also from high touch surfaces. So don't expect to see as many interactive exhibits that you can touch or feel, or any at all, depending on the museum. Some places might get a little creative with your other senses though. Visitors will may find um, museums imaginatively introducing smells rather than necessarily touching things or lights or, or um, visuals. And expect the experience to be more guided and directed. Less open roaming, more follow the path. Another thing, you may want to bring a snack when you come. Not every museum is going to have food service available, so just be sure to check beforehand. And one last bit of food for thought to leave you with. Lots of museums are actively collecting objects and artifacts that reflect the current pandemic. So it is entirely possible that the next time you come to a museum, the marquee exhibit may look very familiar. Still ahead on the National, an emergency medevac plane was trying to land in a small community in Alaska, but the runway lights were out. I've never had to, you know, go run to the airport and um, line my vehicle up or line vehicles up and to have an airplane land. How the small community scrambled to light up the darkness. But first. All right, hold on to that. Well, leave it to David Blaine to take his latest stunt to new heights, literally. The illusionist went up, up and away in what the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration called an experimental aircraft or 52 helium-filled balloons, to be more precise. He was supposed to fly over New York City, 
but safety concerns relocated the feat to the desert in Arizona. Blaine says he was inspired by the 1956 French short film, The Red Balloon. But with his daughter watching from below, it's hard not to see another comparison. He even stopped for a mid-flight check-in with her. But remember, we went to the Arctic Circle and we had New Year's yeah. Eve and freezing yeah. cold temperatures? Well, that was helping to prepare for this. Little humor as he continued his ascent, controlling his altitude by dropping bags of sand, eventually reaching just below 25,000 feet before this month. That was awesome! The end to a successful stunt years in the making, an escape from reality fit for this moment in time. You did it Shut down. Shut down. So that's Harry and Meghan planting flowers yesterday, 23 years and a day since the death of his mother, Diana. The values Diana passed on to her sons are reflected in today's big news about the couple. They have signed a rich contract with Netflix to produce film and TV content. Thomas Dagler shows us how values of charity and empathy are all part of the package. Hi guys. Well, hey, how are you doing? From their big new house in California, Prince Harry and Meghan have struck a big new deal. And it's on us now. It's on all of us collectively to make the world a better place. They're still involved in charity work, recently handing out school supplies to children in need. But the couple's agreement with Netflix will likely make them millions. Netflix, of course, made sense. It's a global powerhouse. They're starting their own production company, promising documentaries, shows, and children's programming. We're ready for you, Your Majesty. To stream exclusively on the same service that portrays the royals on The Crown. Just months after Harry and Meghan broke away from that same family in real life. What this shows is that they wanted a bigger footprint media-wise. Um, and that it was never about privacy, that it was always about control. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex say in a statement, through our work with diverse communities and their environments, to shining a light on people and causes around the world, our focus will be on creating content that informs, but also gives hope. I am from the south side of Chicago. That might look a lot like what Barack and Michelle Obama have done since signing their own Netflix deal in 2018. This could never have happened in the UK. People here in the media who are gatekeepers are not used to women having an opinionated, confident voice. I'm Rachel Zanel. The former star of the TV show Suits, wow, Megan isn't expected to get back into acting, instead keen to help the ongoing push against racism. I'm using my voice in a way that I haven't been able to up late, so yeah, it's good to be home. Already, the British tabloids are labeling the deal Megabucks, a reminder of the criticism they left in London and the prize that awaits in Hollywood. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Well, next on The National, a small Alaskan town lights up the night. I was, she was like, should I call more people? Like, yes, call more people. We need more people down here at the runway. We need to line, it, line up the runway. Our community scrambled to save a life right after this. In the small community of Igiyagig, Alaska, the phrase, it takes a village, took on a whole new meaning when this village came together to save a child's life. So a medevac had been called for the sick child, but the airport runway lights had failed and the plane couldn't land. So the community lit up the dark themselves. And that's our moment. We heard a plane fly over and it sounded like a truck because it was so low to the village. I went to the local pilot. I asked him, are the lights working? He said, no, I'm trying to get them going. And then I was like, okay, should I go light up one end of the runway? And he says, go ahead, try. And my neighbor called and she was like, did the Medivac plane land yet? She was like, should I call more people? Like, yes, call more people. We need more people down here at the runway. And then more and more people started showing up and they were like lining up at every light and in between each light. You know, I was like 
so happy because, you know, we were able to get the plane to land. The patient was able to get onto the airplane. It's really nice to be able to know that you, you can be able to call your neighbor and be like, hey, I need help. They'll run out in their pajamas, they'll drop whatever they're doing, and they'll come and help. This is amazing. So mm. first things first, good news is the little girl is okay. Uh, she's still in Anchorage, but she's going to be fine. But she's not kidding about the pajamas. So it was 11.30 at night. Uh, they called 32 people. All 32 people answered and right. dashed out there in their PJs. Well, and here's the other amazing thing. 32 people, that's almost, literally, almost half of the population of that village. So no small feat there. That's the National for this Wednesday, September 2nd. Have a good night. Good night.